This is going to be called Things God Built Into His Bible. Seven things God built into his Bible. And I'm, sa I'm not saying that there's just seven. There's way more than that. I, just, I thought that was a good stopping point when I got to the seventh one. Maybe I'll do another one. But the first thing I want to say God built into his Bible is a dictionary. If you want to find out what something means in the Bible, you can actually use the Bible itself to do that. You see, the author, the Lord, built in the definition for the words in his book. You say, I can't use a King James Bible. The words are just too hard to understand. How many times have you heard somebody say that? Or how many times have you said that? Well, I have a six-year-old daughter reading a chapter a night out of the King James Bible. She can read most of the words. And for the words that are hard to understand, you can reread the verse, read the entire chapter, and really examine the surrounding verses, and you can mostly come up with, with the meaning of the word. And God makes it to where you don't even need a Webster's 1828 dictionary. Really, I mean, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how God built a dictionary into the Bible itself. Just a few examples. For example, the word quick. Go to number 1630. It says in number 1630, But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. So, for years I thought, well, that means they went down really fast into the pit. Because it says they, they go down quick into the pit. I thought, well, they went down really fast. But then I got a little bit more acquainted with the Bible. And I read verse 33 of the same chapter, number 1633. And it says, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. So then I'm saying to myself, oh, wow, they went down alive into the pit. I'm thinking to myself, okay, I've got it. Quick means alive, and for further clarification on it, you can search the word quick to get the definition. If you're still struggling, search the word throughout the Bible, and look what you find. In First Peter 4 and verse 5, it says, Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? So quick and the dead, obviously, that's like saying alive and the dead. So when you read that God quickened you, it doesn't mean he gave you a speed boost, like I used to think that it meant. It means he made you alive. And you see that it said the word quick in number 1630, then said the same phrase with the word alive in number 1633. So you see, if you read, reread the verse and then read the surrounding verses or even the entire chapter, it's going to show you what the word means. I'm going to give you another one. This, this is another one. Uh, what about the word betwixt? In Genesis 17:11. It says, And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Now, you probably don't say the word betwixt much. And it's probably obvious what it means, but for some people that may not know what it means, or they may approach the Bible and say, What in the world does betwixt mean? They may say, I've never heard such a word. Well, you read the verse before it. In Genesis 17, 10, it says, This is my covenant which she shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. So it says between me and you in verse 10, and then betwixt me and you in verse 11. So betwixt means between. See, most times you can get the definition for the verse right there in the chapter or the surrounding verses. If you can't do that, you can search the word throughout the Bible and get the definition that way. And you can also look for the first time it's mentioned and get the definition that way. So betwixt means between. Quick means alive. And this is just two of thousands of examples. I'm not going to just keep giving words 
to, to define them for you. I'm just giving you examples to show you God built a dictionary into his Bible. That's an amazing thing. And this, this is, I'm trying to get you impressed with the Bible. That's my main goal. I want you to be impressed, not with me, but with the Bible. I want you to be so impressed with the Bible that you're just going to dive into it and just be obsessed with it. But this is just two of thousands of examples. Read the verses surrounding the word. Read the entire chapter and search the word through the scriptures and you'll get the definition. God built a dictionary into his Bible. Why don't you read your Bible? You can't say, well, I don't understand it. Well, he put the dictionary in there. And then he, stuck, he even took it a step further and blessed you with some geniuses out there to make some Bible dictionaries and some Bible commentaries if you still need help. But it's the Bible itself and its built-in dictionary that's perfect and inspired. The next thing is the Bible, the Lord built into his Bible, an encyclopedia. If you want information on a subject or person, or event in the Bible. You don't necessarily have to go anywhere except the Bible itself. That's the best place to go is to the Bible itself. For example, if you read Job 41 and you read about Leviathan and you want to know more about this creature in the Bible, don't get stressed out about it. Just search the scriptures and you'll find out more about Leviathan. If you want to know who that is, just search the Bible to figure it out. The Bible is, has a built-in encyclopedia. It can give you more information about Leviathan than Wikipedia. You know, they got Wikipedia on the internet. You go, you type in a person, place, or thing, and it gives you all this information about it. Well, look at... Well, you've read Job 41, and it talks about Leviathan. Go to the scriptures, search for the word Leviathan. And it'll take you to a place like... Psalm 104, 25 through 26, where it says, so, so is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. So we can see Leviathan is an actual creature that lives in the water. But that's not all. Leviathan is also the old dragon himself. Look at Isaiah 27, 1. It says, In that day the Lord, with his sore and great and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. So it called him a piercing serpent, a crooked serpent, and a dragon. You see, the Bible is giving you all this information about Leviathan. So if you notice it calls him the piercing serpent, the crooked serpent, and the dragon, who might that be? What might his identity be? Well, look at Revelation 20 and verse 2. It says, And he laid hold on the dragon, the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So now you know that Leviathan is an actual creature who is a picture of the real Leviathan. The real Leviathan is the devil, Satan, and that old serpent. The devil is Leviathan, but there is also an actual creature that pictures the real Leviathan. And that's why Job 41 says, he's king over all the children of pride. How could just a regular water creature be king over all the children of pride? It has to be the devil himself. And if you want more information about Leviathan, then you just search the devil, Satan, the dragon, which will lead you to even more keywords. You see, the Bible has a built-in encyclopedia. If you want to know more about the day of the Lord, search it. Want to know more about the life of Enoch? Search the name Enoch, and you'll find more information about him in the New Testament that wasn't even in the Old Testament. You see, information about topics people within the Bible, the events within the Bible, and everything else is found in the scriptures themselves. You could search that topic throughout the Bible and come up with a whole big list of information. And that's how you can put together a topical lesson or a biographical lesson about a person in the Bible. So the Bible has built-in dictionary, built-in encyclopedia. 
The next thing is that it has built-in pictures. You see, even to this day, I love a good picture book. And when me and my daughter, uh, we do our daily reading, we have to throw in a good picture book. And I still even like kids' books because of the cool pictures. And I've got that Bible picture book by Michael Pearl. And it's a bit odd, and it's kind of too graphic for the kids in some places, but it's just cool to look at. And I've got that Action Bible that you can buy at Walmart. And I've always liked picture books, but there's something a lot better than those books, and that is the Bible itself. It has a lot more pictures. And these pictures are painted by the one who invented sunrises and sunsets. These pictures in the Bible are painted by the person who invented waterfalls that created the water itself and invented flowers and butterflies or whatever you think is the most glorious looking creation that there is. The person who made those things is the person that painted the pictures in the Bible. Someone said a woman is the most beautiful creation. Well, God made that too. He formed her just out of a man's rib. So someone said a bride is the most beautiful thing ever. Well, the Lord's the one that made the bride. The Lord's the one who made it possible for you to get in the bride. And the one who prepared the holy city that's prepared as a bride adorned for her husband was the Lord. So the one who made all these things is God. And if he can make outer space and the deep waters and the oceans, if he can create all these things, if he can make all those galaxies then he can paint a pretty picture in the scriptures. You just got to be in the club to really see and understand the pictures. And all you got to do to get in the club is you just got to get saved and you're in. You see, when the average person looks at the Bible, they see black words on white paper and some dust. They say an old, they say, you know, it's just an old book full of names. They see it as just some old book on grandma's bookshelf that grandma's in 20. 22 don't even read anymore but a saved born again bible believer opens that book and he sees stuff coming off the pages he sees stuff coming off the pages and flying around the room he sees so many layers that it's like a never-ending loaf of bread that never gets moldy and just always stays fresh and it's got the crust pre-cut off of that and God built some pictures into his Bible. There, there, you just have to have your Bible goggles on. And when I read Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22, I see a picture of the father giving his beloved son as a sacrifice. When I read David and Goliath, I see a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ slaying the Antichrist. When I read Adam and Eve, I see a picture of the last Adam, the Lord Jesus, and his bride, the church. When I read David showing kindness to Mephibosheth for Jonathan's sake. You know what I read? I, 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 you know what I see? I see a picture of the Father showing me kindness for Jesus' sake. The Bible is a picture book, and the Old Testament illustrates it. The Old Testament illustrates the New Testament. You just have to put your Bible goggles on and then keep those Bible goggles on when you go to work and you see the world and you interact with people and you'll find that things look a lot different than you always thought they looked and you see things for what they really are. You'll start thinking you're like the Roddy Popper guy or something in that They Live movie. You see, those, those billboards will look a lot different. TV will look a lot different. Things that you thought were pretty will turn out to be repulsive. So the Bible's like a dictionary, an encyclopedia. It's got pictures. And what more could you ask for? But yet, that's not all. There's more. It's got built-in prophecy. You see, why would you need Miss Cleo? Why would you need these psychic scammers? See, I used to print call psychics as a kid, and, you know, you had to be 18 years or older to call, so I'd say... You know, if you're a psychic, how did you not know that I wasn't 18? How did you not know that I'm not 18? And the guy would say, you know, have an honest life, kid. And I'd be like, I wonder what that means. But did he see something? No. He didn't see anything. 
And you don't need no psychics. You don't need no astrologers or observers of times. I don't need to go to Gatlinburg and let that weird lady read my palms. The Bible has a built-in... The Bible's got built-in prophecy. And as a kid, I, wa I used to watch the Back to the Future movies. I watched a lot of things back then I probably shouldn't have. And Michael J. Fox went to the future and got this sports almanac that told him all the winners of the Super Bowl, the World Series, the PGA, or whatever else, and... The villain in the movie got a hold of that thing and went back to the past and got rich betting on all the winners of the sports games. But the thing is, I've got something better than that. I've got the book that tells me who's going to win the final battle, and I know which team to get on, and that is Team Lord Jesus Christ. You see, I got the book that told me about a lake of fire. It told me about a second coming, and I bet my soul on the winner. You see, God voted for me, and the devil voted for me, and I broke the tie and chose the Lord. I bet my soul on a book. And the first step of being a Bible believer is betting your soul on the book. You see, a real Bible believer has bet his soul on the book. I mean, even people who don't necessarily believe the Bible, they're, they're still, they've still bet their soul on the book if they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why I don't understand people who use other versions of the Bible and... They say that there's no perfect Bible. Well, then that means they bet their soul on a book that wasn't perfect. But you see, if you're a Bible believer, then you know you've bet your soul on a book that is perfect. And you've bet your soul on a book that was written by somebody who knows everything. Isaiah 46.10 says, Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. He declares the end from the beginning. You see, God isn't bound by time. He can hold time in the palm of his hand. And imagine one of those Clarence Larkin charts that show you some events from Genesis to Revelation. Take that even further and add every detail and every person and every event and everything that ever happened since time was even invented and God has that laid out in his mind. He's got a chart of that laid out in his mind. And it's like, you know, he's got a, a DVD remote or something and he has seen selection on there for all of history if he wanted to he can go back and look here he can go back and look in the yesterday or in the future or whatever you see the person who invented time and the person who's not bound by time is the one who wrote the bible and he built prophecy into the Bible. He is so omnipresent that he is presently with you right now, but he's also in the future. And if you go back there and read in the Old Testament, he's back there too. You can't get away from him. You can count on the built-in prophecies because the one who is the beginning and the ending, the I Am, the Alpha and Omega, is the one who built them in there. So since the Lord is also ever-present in the present... You know what else he built into his Bible? A newspaper. He built a newspaper into his Bible. In Galatians 1.4 it says, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. Definitely it is a present evil world, and the Bible keeps its relevancy. It's like reading a newspaper. Seeing as how Solomon himself said in Ecclesiastes 1.9, The thing that hath been is, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new, new thing under the sun. You see, the Bible gives you headlines for today without having to give you all the gory details. You see, in 2 Timothy 3, one through 6 it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away, for of this sort are they which creep into houses, and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. You see, my grandparents were big newspaper readers, and they mentioned to me before that I should really read the newspaper and stay up to date with the news. And I'm thinking, I'm already up to date. I've got a Bible. You see, the kids don't mind their parents. That's why the kids. That's why the Bible talks about kids being disobedient to their parents. Men love their own selves. 
They are unthankful. They are unholy. They don't have natural affection. They are fierce. They can't be pleased. You see, when you read 2 Timothy 3, you're reading a newspaper. And you know, Oprah and soap operas are creeping into houses unaware and leading captive silly women. And all that's why the world me is messed up. So I'm up to date. The Bible just let me know there in 2 Timothy 3 what's going on. And you see, I may not know the date and the name of the people involved and the place of the violent, vile, wicked, sinful act that took place, but I know it does happen and why it happens. No, I don't know the names of everyone in the White House. I don't know the names of the people they want you to vote for locally. But I know most of them are liars, and most times you're just voting for the lesser of two evils when you, when you vote for these type of things. Because Psalms 2 and verse 2 said, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So I know that most people in high up authority are against the Lord, and you're just voting for the lesser of two evils. I know why the school shootings happen, 2 Timothy 3 told me. I know why kids don't mind their parents, 2 Timothy 3 told me. You know, I never did get on the Trump train. I got on the Jesus train and got predestinated to go to heaven. You see, the Jesus train was predestinated for eternal life, and the Holy Spirit came by and said, I can give you a ride to heaven, you know, if you're willing. So I chose of my own free will to hop in. And I know there won't be anything good happen, anything really good happen until Jesus comes back and the Jesus train stops in Jerusalem and he gets off and sits on the throne. You see, um, you see, I, I chose the Lord Jesus Christ. I chose to get on the Jesus train. I didn't choose to get on these political trains down here because... There's not going to be any peace and, until the real Prince of Peace comes, the Lord Jesus. But the Bible is a built-in newspaper. It keeps you up to date with everything that's going on. It doesn't may not give you the names and the places and the titles of the events where it took place. Because it doesn't have to. All that stuff's going to be forgotten anyway. But the next thing, the Bible is a built-in history book. If you want to have a good understanding of the Bible then you need to read and understand that the Bible is also a history book. And a history book, not just written by anybody, but written by someone who was present throughout all the history. Written by someone who saw every little detail, the entire event, the people involved, and has complete memory and recall of everything that happened. And if you want to learn the Bible, then you need to go back there and learn your history. See how that God was forming the nation of Israel in the book of Genesis through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You get to the next book and you're going to see the calling out of Israel in the book of Exodus through Ruth. Then you're going to see the establishing of the nation of Israel in First and Second Samuel and at the beginning of First Kings. And then you see the demise of the nation of Israel in First Kings when Solomon goes into rebellion and his son Rehoboam causes the kingdom to split and they get into idolatry. So you'll see the, their demise and rebellion through idolatry and 1 Kings and 2 Kings. And on through the rest of the Old Testament, you will read the prophets and the minor prophets blasting them for their idolatry. That's just leading them to their demise. You see, the Old Testament is a history book about the nation of Israel. And the Jews can trace their lineage all the way back to Adam. It's a history book. It tells them all about their history. Isn't it amazing? that the Bible has a built-in history book. And then you can get into the New Testament, and it gives you the history of the church. And those seven churches in Revelation can represent the seven periods of church history. But the last thing, the Bible has a built-in how-to for dummies series. If the Bible was just a history book, then it wouldn't be as enjoyable as reading about you know, just it wouldn't even be as enjoyable as reading about any other thing in history. It's so much more than that. It's a how-to for dummies book. You see, God wrote it for the common man, just like me and you. And that's why David Hoffman named his Bible the Common Man's Reference Bible. It's not for scholars. It's not for real smart people. I mean, it's for everybody. The Bible goes beyond just history and actually gives us instructions 
on how to live in every situation. It has built-in instructions. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Want to know how to be a better husband? Read Ephesians 5. Want to know how to be a better wife? Read 1 Peter 3. Want to know how to get saved? Read Romans and Galatians. It is a how-to book for dum-dums like me and you, and you can base your whole life around the principles taught in the Bible. So the Bible has a built-in dictionary. It has a built-in encyclopedia. It has a built-in pictures. It's got a built-in newspaper. It's got built-in prophecy. It's got a built-in how-to for dummy series. Everything you need is in the Bible. You know, some stores you go to, it's got everything you need in there. You don't have to go anywhere else. You can just go there and get everything you need it's, uh, without having to run around all over the place. You don't have to run around all over Tarnation, as they say. The Bible's got everything built into it. You can just go to it. You don't have to run around all over the Internet. You don't have to run around all over the library. It's got everything you need. Now, all that stuff, that other stuff is there, too. And that could be useful. But the Bible is really where it's at.